Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to provide you with an update as to what's happening in the Chinese economy, and more specifically, the property sector. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that I've been talking on and off about Evergrande for a long period of time. In fact, the first video that I ever posted on this topic was back in September 2021. So Evergrande has been in a state of crisis for over two years. However, things are really starting to heat up right now, and it looks like we're getting to the sharp end of Evergrande's journey. The chairman has now been arrested, and that follows on from other arrests that have taken place over the course of the last week for Evergrande's wealth management arm. And the company recently posted results, which showed that in 2021 and 2022 combined, the company made a loss of $81 billion. That is an astronomical figure, particularly when you take into account the fact that the company has over $340 billion worth of debt. Over the course of the last 12 months, Evergrande has been in the process of putting together a restructuring to try and restructure all of its debts. However, the company has recently announced that it's no longer in a position to be able to issue any new bonds. And as a direct result, the shares have now been suspended on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And this really highlights the severity of the situation because the Evergrande shares were suspended for almost 18 months between March 2022 and the end of August 2023 and have only recently relisted. So the situation for Evergrande right now looks critical and there is a genuine risk that the company could be going into liquidation. But unfortunately for China, the Chinese economy and the Chinese property market, the largest developer in the market, Country Garden, is also on the verge of defaulting on its debts. And in today's episode, we're going to have a look at what's going on in the sector. And I can tell you that 34 of the top 50 developers in China are currently in default. That tells you how serious this situation is. And these developers are absolutely enormous. We're not talking about companies that are building one or two developments simultaneously. These companies are building hundreds. And in Country Garden's situation, thousands of developments simultaneously. And these developments are also absolutely huge. It's not uncommon for these developments to include tens of thousands of apartments. So in today's episode, we'll have a look at the list of the developers that are currently in default and what's happening with their bond prices. Because unfortunately for the global economy, what's going on in China isn't going to be contained to the Chinese economy. This is going to have global ramifications because there are a lot of institutions all around the world who've been buying paper. They've been investing into the Chinese property market over the course of the last 10 years. And there has been a significant reduction in the value of all of that paper. So we'll have a look at what's going on in the wider market. We'll then have a look at the Evergrande situation. We'll talk about the arrest of the chairman and founder, what's likely to happen to him. And unfortunately, there are precedents in China where individuals who've been running companies who've been found guilty of fraud have actually been executed in the past. So this is a really serious situation from his point of view. We'll have a look at the financial situation of Evergrande and the proposed restructuring plan, which now looks like it's been torpedoed because Evergrande isn't in a position to be able to issue the new bonds that it wanted to. We'll then have a look at the Country Garden situation because until now, Country Garden had been the poster boys of the Chinese property market. But unfortunately, things are starting to unwind rapidly for them. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think is likely to happen over the course of the next three to six months and whether we are likely to see an implosion in the property market and also the Chinese economy before the end of 2023. But before we get started on all of that, I wanted to remind you that if you're interested in seeing more face-to-face -face videos like this and also avoiding the adverts that you see frequently on YouTube, then please check out my Patreon channel. But if you don't like Patreon and you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to buy me a coffee as well as YouTube's super thanks and membership scheme. This table shows the list of all of the Chinese property development companies that have missed offshore bond payments since July 2020. As you can see, there are a lot of companies on this list, 55 excluding Country Garden Holdings. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, 34 of these companies are ranked in the top 50 Chinese property developers. So this really starts to give you an indication of the severity of the problem in China right now. 
Now, for all of you that have an objection to me reading out lists, don't worry, I'm not going to read out 55 Chinese property development company names. I'd struggle to pronounce some of them anyway. But I think the point here is that this list only covers the companies that have issued offshore bonds. So these are companies that have issued international bonds in dollars or other currencies. And of course, in addition to these companies, there are hundreds of other Chinese property development companies that have not issued international bonds. So the scale of the problem is actually significantly larger than we're seeing on this list. And in terms of understanding why the problem has got so severe for property developers, this table shows the year-on-year -year change in contracted sales. And what this shows is that in 2020, the level of contracted sales was almost 11% higher than it was in 2019. So the property market itself was still doing very well at that point. And in the first half of 2021, there was almost a 35% increase in the level of contracted sales, which means that at that point, the market was on fire. That is phenomenal growth in the first half of that year. However, since that point, things have gone severely south. In the second half of 2021, the level of contracted sales fell by almost 30%. In 2022, contracted sales were down by more than 56%. And in the first half of 2023, they've fallen by a further 30%. And this data gives us the fundamental reason as to why the property developers are in such dire straits at the moment. The bottom has fallen out of the property market. Chinese consumers no longer want to buy property in the same way as they did four or five years ago. Now, in terms of looking at the financial implications of the failure of the Chinese property developers, this chart looks at the relative value of high yield bonds issued by Chinese developers over the course of the last three years. And what we're looking at here is what these bonds are trading for in the secondary market. When a company issues a bond, the holder of that bond has the option of selling it in the secondary market in the same way that shares are traded on stock exchanges. Bonds are generally issued for a set period of time, might be five years or 10 years. And at the end of that period, the company will pay back the amount that it borrowed under that bond. Now, if a company is performing well, but you decide that you want to sell your bond because you need the cash, you may have to sell that bond for 95 cents on the dollar. So a 5% discount to the 100 cent on the dollar that you paid at issuance. However, if a company is not performing well and there is a risk that the bondholder might not get paid back at the end of the five or 10 year period, then the bond can trade for significantly less than the 100 cents that it was issued for. And what we have on these charts are five different price categories. The light green category is for bonds that are trading above 70 cents. So when you're selling in the secondary market, you might get paid 70 or 75 cents for that bond. The gray section represents bonds that are trading between 50 and 69 cents. The yellow section, bonds that are trading between 30 and 49 cents. The orange section, bonds that are trading between 10 and 29 cents. So this obviously represents a significant reduction in the value of that bond. And then the pink section at the bottom represents bonds that are trading below 10 cents. So that means that if you were selling that bond in the secondary market, you will have lost more than 90% of your original investment. So if we have a look at the situation in June 2021, you can see that 95% of the high yield bonds that had been issued by Chinese property developers were trading for more than 70 cents. So that indicates that the market was comfortable with the risk and that on the whole, the market considered Chinese property developers to be doing quite well. If we now look at the situation in June 2022, you can see that there was a marked change in market attitude and the percentage of bonds trading above 70% reduced from 95% to 16.5%. So that meant that the vast majority of the market was trading below 70. And if we look at the breakdown, 12% were trading between 50 and 69 cents, 9% were trading between 30 and 49 cents, 39%, so the majority of the market was trading between 10 and 29 cents, and 24% were trading below 10 cents. So that meant that 71.5% of all of the bonds that have been issued by Chinese property developers were trading for less than 49 cents. If we now look at the situation for August 2023, you can see that the deterioration in the market value of these bonds has continued at pace. 
And the vast majority of the market, 74% of all of those bonds are now trading for less than 10 cents on the dollar. And what that tells us is that the market is not expecting those bonds to be repaid. Once a price falls below 10 cents, the only people who are buying those bonds are vulture funds. Funds that think there is an outside chance that they might be able to recover some money, whether it be through taking the company to court, some legal action, something along those lines. But the vast majority of the market, so people who are in bonds to actually hold them through to maturity, don't think that there is any chance that you're going to get your money back. So what this data tells us is that everybody is expecting these companies to have to restructure their entire debt facilities and probably write off the full value of their bonds. The world's most indebted company is in deeper trouble. Shares in Chinese property giant Evergrande plunged on Monday morning. They were down as much as 24% in early Hong Kong trade. That after it warned it was unable to issue new debt due to an investigation into one of its subsidiaries. Group firm Hengda Real Estate said last month that it was being probed by regulators over suspected violations regarding the disclosure of information. On Monday, Evergrande said that meant it did not qualify to issue new bonds. Now the turmoil piles pressure on Evergrande's restructuring plans. Earlier this month, it delayed a decision on what to do about its offshore debts, saying creditors needed more time to think. The firm needs approval from 75% of the holders of each debt class to proceed with restructuring. But sentiment on the whole sector remains feverish, with major rivals like Country Garden also teetering close to default. The chairman and founder of Evergrande, Hui Ka Yan, has been placed under police surveillance raising more doubts about the developer's future as it grapples with mounting prospects of liquidation. And the detention of Evergrande's founder comes days after a number of Evergrande Wealth Management employees were arrested by police in Shenzhen. And in that situation, the police stated, Recently, public security organisations took criminal compulsory measures against Du and other suspected criminals at Evergrande Financial Wealth Management. No further details were given on how many people were detained, or their identities except for the person identified only as do, or what charges they could face. However, in a post on social media, the police called on the public to report any further cases of suspected fraud. Now, this situation is extremely serious for both the founder and the employees of Evergrande. The former chairman of China Life Insurance, Wang Bin, was recently found guilty of taking $44 million in bribes and was sentenced to death but currently has a two-year reprieve and is hoping that the sentence will be commuted to life in prison without parole. He's the latest boss from a major Chinese financial institution to be ensnared in President Jinping's two-year-long crackdown on corruption in the financial industry. The former chairman of Hurong, one of China's largest state-controlled asset management companies, was executed after being found guilty of corruption and bigamy. The same year, former China Development Bank chairman Hu Bang was sentenced to life in prison in an 85 million yuan bribery case. After a long period of delay, Evergrande has now published its financial results for 2021 and 2022, which show that the company made a loss of $66 billion in 2021 and a further loss of $15 billion in 2022, giving a combined total loss for the two years of $81 billion. The shares of Evergrande have been suspended since March 2022. However, to avoid being delisted, Evergrande had to report the results no later than September the 20th, 2023. And immediately following the lifting of the suspension and the posting of the results, the share price fell by more than 80%. The financial filings also revealed that Evergrande's total debts are now above $340 billion which equates to around 2% of China's total GDP. Evergrande's total assets are now valued at $256 billion, which means that the company could be insolvent. Over the course of the last two years, the company's employee headcount has fallen by 17% and now stands at just under 103,000 people. So all of this obviously paints a very poor picture for Evergrande, but the most serious matter right now is the fact that Evergrande is currently unable to meet the terms and conditions of its own restructuring plan.
Under the terms of the proposed restructuring, creditors were given a basket of options to swap their debt into new bonds and equity-linked instruments backed by the group. In the two main options, creditors can either swap all of their holdings into new notes with maturities of between 10 and 12 years, or convert them into different combinations of new notes of 5 to 9 years and equity-linked instruments. However, Evergrande have now announced that in view of an investigation into Heng the Real Estate Group, its flagship offshore unit, it's now unable to meet the qualifications for the issuance of new notes under its debt restructuring plan. The Evergrande unit is currently being probed by Chinese securities regulator for suspected violation of information disclosure. And in a statement issued to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Evergrande's founder said, holders of the company's securities and potential investors of the company are advised to exercise caution when dealing in the securities of the company. This setback for Evergrande comes at a time when another developer, China Oceanwide Holdings, has advised the markets that a Bermuda court has ordered its winding up and appointed joint provisional liquidators. The winding up petitions against Evergrande and Oceanwide are among a growing list of such proceedings launched against developers after they failed to meet their debt payment obligations. Oceanwide's winding up court order, filed after it missed some debt payments, is one of a few to have been carried out against a defaulted developer in recent years. Many of the defaulted developers have been trying to get their offshore creditors' approval for debt restructuring plans to avoid collapse or being forced into liquidation proceedings. The latest development in the Evergrande saga comes as leading developers such as Country Garden scramble to avoid a default, keeping home buyer sentiment depressed despite Beijing's support measures to prop up the sector and spur property demand. As at the end of August, the combined floor area of unsold homes in China stood at 648 million square metres, or 7 billion square feet. And in a recent interview, a leading expert in the Chinese property market said that the 1.4 billion population would be unable to fill all of the empty and unbuilt apartments if they were all constructed. China's largest property developer, Country Garden, has reported a $6.7 billion loss for the first half of 2023 in a stock exchange filing. Country Garden, which was China's largest real estate firm in 2022, has four times as many building projects underway as Evergrande. The company has racked up debts of more than $150 billion and has recently advised the market that it failed to make interest payments on two of its loans. It's also warned the markets that if its financial performance continues to deteriorate, it faces possible default. In its filing to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, the company said, The shrinkage of the property sector, coupled with the not yet restored confidence of the capital market, exerted mounting pressure on the company's business operation. It added that it will try its best to improve its operating cash flow by ensuring good sales performance, strive to revitalize underperforming assets, and reducing inessential administrative expenses. The earnings report came out as Country Garden is negotiating with creditors to reschedule debt payments so as to avert a default. The company is also proposing to issue new stock worth 255 million Chinese yuan. Country Garden provides work for tens of thousands of people and is ranked by Forbes among the world's 500 largest companies. Its boss, Wang Huan, was until recently the richest woman in Asia. One of the most famous projects that Country Garden is developing is its sprawling $100 billion development in Malaysia. Built as a paradise with turtles and white sandy beaches, Country Garden's Forest City development in the state of Johor next to Singapore aims to house 700,000 people across 7,000 acres on four reclaimed islands, which is due to complete in 2035. Forest City is a joint venture between Country Garden and a private Malaysian company backed by the Sultan of Johor, and the state government and has been beset by problems ranging from environmental to regulatory issues since its inception in 2016. Seven years in, Country Garden has only invested $4.3 billion into the project compared with the initial $100 billion plan. And the development currently houses fewer than 10,000 people, around 1% of its target. As financial stress mounts on Country Garden, help from the Malaysian government will be crucial for the success of the development, and the company may have to bring in external investors to revive the project. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video really to bring you right up to speed as to what's happening in the Chinese property market. And the reason that this is so important is that it makes up around 30% 
of China's total GDP. So it has a massive influence on the whole Chinese economy. And as we've seen from today's video, the market is in complete disarray and tatters. The vast majority of the large developers are currently in default. 34 out of the top 50 have defaulted on their debt. That tells you how serious this situation is. And up until this point, Country Garden was seen as being exempt from all of those problems. But it's now found itself in a situation where it's also run out of cash and it's on the verge of default. If it doesn't make its next debt coupon payment by the middle of October, then it will officially be in default. And this will be yet another of these large developers that's in a cash crisis. And the reason for this is obviously twofold. Firstly, these companies took on way too much debt. Over the course of the last 15 to 20 years, debt was freely available and the Chinese authorities encouraged Chinese banks and Chinese companies to give out and take on as much debt as they could get their hands on. And that fueled an explosion in terms of the property sector. Whole cities were growing up all across China. Tens of thousands of apartments were being constructed in single developments. And the Chinese consumers couldn't get enough. They were queuing around the block to buy these apartments off plan. And in many situations, Chinese purchasers actually paid up to 100% of the purchase price in advance of the property being built, which sounds absolutely crazy. But the Chinese banks were prepared to give them the loan and they were prepared to hand the money over to the developers. And everybody trusted that the developers were doing the right thing, they would build these apartments and everyone would be a winner. But unfortunately, what's happened is a lot of the cash that was being given to those developers was used to start new developments. So rather than finishing the development that they've been paid for, they was used that as a stake to take on more debt to build another development in another city. And unfortunately, as those debts started to build up and the cash started to run out, the developers couldn't afford to finish the apartment blocks. And it's estimated that there are currently around 1.6 million apartments that have been paid for in advance that have not been constructed in China. So that equates to 1.6 million families who've got that debt. They're paying those mortgages or they've given over their whole life savings to these companies and they literally don't have anything to show for it. So these people are in hardship and the property developers don't have the cash. They can't return the money because they've invested it into more developments. And neither can they finish those developments and hand over the apartments because the Chinese authorities have cut off the supply of debt. The three red lines policy that was brought in a number of years ago was designed to stop these companies getting to the point of being over leveraged. But unfortunately for the Chinese authorities and the Chinese developers, it came in too late. Those companies were already over leveraged. And the fact that they had their debt supply cut off simply meant that they couldn't continue trading in the same way. They couldn't finish all of those builds. And as a result, they ran out of cash. And that's why the vast majority of the Chinese developers are currently in default. Now, as I mentioned right at the start of this video, I've been talking about Evergrande for more than two years. So this situation isn't new. And you may be thinking, well, yeah, the Chinese property market, it's always going to be like this. It'll be constantly defaulting, but nobody is going to do anything about it. But I think what we've seen over the course of the last couple of months is a sea change in the way these companies are being dealt with. As we discussed earlier in the video, the chairman and founder of Evergrande has now been placed under house arrest. He's being observed by the police and they are going through these financial records. A number of people from the wealth management arm were arrested recently. And so there is now a full investigation going on as to whether or not there was any fraudulent activity. And if there was, there is a very high likelihood that the chairman and founder of Evergrande will be arrested, will be charged. And if he's found guilty, he's in serious trouble. He definitely faces the risk of spending the rest of his life in jail. But as we talked about earlier in the video, there is a precedent here that China have actually used the death penalty for situations like this previously. So the current developments definitely represent a ramping up in terms of the way the authorities are dealing with this situation. And what we've seen also from the Evergrande situation is that they're no longer in a position to issue new bonds. And that means that their restructuring plan for the $340 billion of debt is completely blown out of the water now. And if Evergrande doesn't have a workable restructuring plan, 
then it now faces liquidation and insolvency. And if that happens, we are looking at serious losses all across the board. Evergrande has over $340 billion of debt, and of that debt, around $31 billion is in international bonds. So all of that money is at risk of being lost, and this is where the contagion factor comes in. Because the losses won't be contained to China, there will be financial losses all across the world. And what that means is that the institutions that are holding that paper won't get paid, so they'll have less money coming in. And also they may change their attitude to future debt for property deals. So that means that there'll be a contraction in terms of appetite. And so developers all across the world may find it difficult to be able to raise new investment and new capital at a time when they need it most. Because the global economy is currently in a slowdown and companies need to take on investment and debt at times like this to see them through. So there is a real risk that we could get a global contagion as a result of what's happening in Evergrande. But as we've discussed in today's video, this situation is not contained to just Evergrande. China's largest property developer, Country Garden, is also on the verge of default. And this now is a long list of companies that cannot pay their debts. So what we've got right now is a sector that is completely over leveraged, far too much debt. There is no way that all these companies are going to be able to repay all of the people who've given them loan facilities. And so we've got massive losses that are now feeding through. And it looks like the Chinese authorities are biting the bullet and have decided that this needs to now be washed through. They need to see this through to its conclusion. And these companies, if they're not solvent, potentially will go into liquidation and will go down. So we'll see a complete shakeout in the sector and that's not likely to help consumer confidence. And consumer confidence in China right now with regards to the property market is on its knees. In the past, the property market was seen as the golden goose. This was the place to put your money. But that situation has changed. People's attitudes have changed and Chinese consumers no longer believe that developers will actually complete on those builds and so they are no longer paying 100% of the purchase price up front. So this is all really bad news for the Chinese property sector. But that means it's also bad news for the Chinese economy because the property sector makes up around a third of GDP in China. So what all of this is telling us is that over the course of the next three to six months, we're likely to see a lot more pain in the Chinese property sector, which means we're going to see more problems in the Chinese economy and this puts a major question mark over whether or not China can achieve its 5% growth target for 2023. And if it doesn't, then clearly that will have a knock on implication for the global economy because China is the second biggest economy in the world. It buys in lots of things from other countries. And so if the economy is shrinking, that means it will purchase less. So all of the countries who are selling things to China will make less revenue. That will cause a contraction in their economies. And so you can see how the domino effect starts to feed all across the globe. So the overall summary of today's video is that even though we've been talking about the property market for many years now and talking about potential defaults and what's going to happen with Evergrande, it now looks like things are starting to accelerate and come to a head. And it's likely that we will see some of these losses being crystallized over the course of the next six to 12 months. And that's going to be bad news for the Chinese property sector, bad news for the Chinese economy and ultimately bad news for the global economy. So I'll keep you posted on any further news and developments on this and related stories. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.